we've had opportunities in smallmouth. And when people think sight fishing for smallmouth, they think about fishing them on gravel or on their reds. And that's not what I'm talking about at all. This is standing on the rower seat of a drift boat and seeing three or four smallmouth just cruising in that water type and watching him come up Henry's fork style and sip that bug in. So it, it, it's incredible, Dave. I, I mean, I, I do it every day of the week and I have goosebumps talking about it to you right now. That was Tim Landwer describing the feeling of sight fishing for smallmouth. The popper dropper, damselflies, and Joe Exotic today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thank you for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Uh, take one quick moment right now, and if you can, share this episode out there with one other person. This one is going to be huge. If you haven't heard about some of these uh, techniques and tips or heard about Tim, uh, definitely or know somebody that uh, wants to learn how to take smallmouth to the next step, definitely share this one out. Click that link down the bottom and, and click share. Tim Landwer is here to walk us through the step-by-step to catching bass on the surface. Tim shares an insight into how to fish uh, with damselflies, dragonflies, and other surface bugs. Uh, Tim actually wrote the book on these tactics, so get ready for a barn burner. Before we get started, let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. In today's world of mass-produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get your custom net today. That's wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get started right now. Back for another round of smallmouth goodness. Without further ado, here is Tim Landwer from tightlinesflyshop.com. How's it going, Tim? I'm doing great, Dave. How are you this morning, man? Great, great. Yeah, it's good to have you on here. Uh, we were kind of just talking off air there about what would be the best topic to dig into. It's always fun. Uh, you guys are in a, a, a neck of the woods that, I mean, there's a lot going on. You have smallmouth, you have, you know, a bunch of trout fishing, the driftless. I mean, when you, when you, when somebody comes into your shop, let's say you had a, a total like newbie comes from out of town and says, um, I want to go fishing. What, what do you tell them? That's that's a, that's a big one because we get that all the time. Most of the time, people come into the fly shop, and we're in Green Bay, Wisconsin, or De Pere, which is just a southern suburb. Most of the time, the people come in with their hands in their pockets, like, "So you can fly fish here?" You know, <laughs> like they, they have really no concept. They think pretty much just from the Rockies west is is fly fishing territory. But um, I I I was a guide in Big Sky, Montana, and guide on the Madison, the Gallatin rivers, and we chose to open our fly shop here this is where i was born and raised but the diversity of the fishing here is absolutely off the charts like you had mentioned you know the trout fishing in central southwestern wisconsin our native brook trout in the north north woods of wisconsin got some of the finest smallmouth fishing in the world you know when people think muskies it's wisconsin and um and then we have a miniature ocean so whether you call them steelhead or migratory rainbows or you know, what, 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 however PC you want to be, we have that migratory brown, salmon, steelhead, all of that. So it's, it, we got it all. It's you crazy. Know, that That's the crazy thing about it because, you know, we, we kind of talk about it sometimes and, you know, we're like, well, where do we want to like settle down for the long term, you know, and we're, we're kind of right. out West, but you, you think, I mean, out West here, especially, I mean, it's crazy. It's almost like where we live out in Oregon, it's becoming like ex- housing prices, right? Or almost it's like you're living in San Francisco, <laughs> but out there, right? You, you can still buy uh, you can still get 20 acres for oh. a reasonable cost. Is that, is that the case? And, and tell me why, why what are the downsides of that, that, that area? Because it seems like you guys got a lot of great, great stuff going on. I mean, there, there are no downsides there. There, there, there really are no downsides. The, the upside is like you said, the cost of living, you know, there, there's a giant boom everywhere right now in the cost of living. But, um, you know, I, I talked to my old outfitter in big sky a couple of years back and I said, Hey, do any of my buddies live up in the meadow still, you know, can I get a hold of Cristo or Denton or any of those guys? And he's like, Oh, Timmy, none of your friends live in the mountain anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, like, because they're $10 million homes. So, and, and, and the traffic, you know, you, you, you look at the traffic that you're starting to see in a lot of our Western rivers, um, especially, you know, after COVID, a lot of people have fallen in love with this sport as we have. 
and you have a tremendous amount of people. The Midwest here, other than during peak times of steelhead runs, salmon runs, um, the Driftless is getting more attention nationally. But on an average day on a smallmouth trip, if I see a kayak and a canoe, I'm pissed. I'm like, oh, who are these guys? Wow, you know? <laughs> that's amazing. And, and what about and what about tell me this? Because this is the one the one catch we always talk about. Like, okay, you got the winners. Is that something you just embrace and you and you just love? You embrace the suck. It's just what it yeah. is. But um, you know, our trout season closes in middle of October, but we still have open water on some of our Great Lakes tributaries. So we see the big C for Ellen Browns. And they will come in late fall to spawn and then they'll stay. So if you're hardy enough, and this is a different level of Wisconsin hardy, you know, like, can you bust ice out of a two handed rod all day long? Cause that's what you're going to do. Um, you have an opportunity at 20 pound Browns all winter. Oh, wow. So there's stuff going on, but I, 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 I just travel out of the country as much oh, as I there can. You go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So yeah, that's the key. You gotta, you gotta get it set up so you can travel, get away from it. Right. Right. That's a part yeah. of our and business. That, that and that makes out. sense. I, I would say that would be the cool thing. I mean, obviously buddy is part of the equation, but yeah, if you could live in Not Wisconsin. Not in the fly shop world. No. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. Well, that's why the hosted trips that we're trying to do, you'll set some of those up as well, where we can actually go get out and. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, cool. Well, there, there's so many topics, uh, Tim, you know, I mean, that's the thing getting into this. I knew it was going to be one of those where there's a, like a hundred things we could talk about, but I think what we're going to do is focus it today. And I'd love to get you on down the line, you know, but let's just today we're, we're going to think, I think small mouth, if we can get an right arc for the show yeah. before, before we get there, I want to jump in because we kind of skipped ahead. Just take us back really quick. Cause I want to hear your story, uh, fly fishing, how you got into it and then how you came to own a fly shop. Well, I got into it like a lot of people did in in Wisconsin where you fish bluegills with a bobber. You know, the, the difference between the popularity of fly fishing out west and the popularity of fishing in the Midwest comes down to basically a cultural thing. Chances are, if you grew up in Montana or Colorado, you had a fly rod in your hand at some point chasing trout. Where in Wisconsin, it's not the case. I mean, you you fished with a red and white bobber and a Snoopy pole and you caught bluegills, which I did with my dad and you know, my, my whole life growing up. And I was probably 12 or 13. My grandmother had a cabin in Northern Wisconsin and my cousin and I just started dabbling with fly fishing and catching mostly rough fish and just started tying flies and, and like, it just fell in love with it. And my passion from that just grew. And, um, I got to the point I was not ready for college. I was not cut out for that seen emotionally or mentally. <laughs> I was too concerned about the Hendrickson's or the sulfurs at that time. And, um, I got a job at a bank and I worked in a bank as a lender for about two years and then realized I am not a bank guy. I quit. I loaded my truck and drove to big sky, Montana the day that I quit without any plan. And, um, luckily I ran into an outfitter out there who I got to be good friends with who offered me a job to guide. And it kind of grew from that. And I met my wife out there and uh, we moved back here. She finished her undergrad here. And instead of taking the money we had saved to buy a house and kind of do what you have to do, um, she said, let's open the fly shop. Let's do it. And there was no way I was going to fail because when your wife says, I believe you can do it, like you better make it work. <laughs> so, and there it is. And 21 years later, flashback 21 years in February for us. Um, we have a full service fly shop, you know, a giant tying section, online store, destination travel company, and a really, really busy smallmouth guide guide season. So that there's the story, man. That's awesome. And, and I want to dig into the, I know you've talked about this before on other podcasts, but the, uh, the evolution mm -hmm. of smallmouth, because I think it, it's interesting. I always, you know, you, we kind of hear about it, joke about it, the fact that it's the the native trout of the Midwest and all this stuff. But I mean, take us back. Tell us about a little bit that that evolution. How, how did that come to be where bass used to be not thought of as, as, as the greatest fish, right? I think that's the story right there, Dave. I mean, we look at the popularity of trout fishing. And when I told you that people come into the shop, like, what do you, what do you fish for? That is the assumption in our sport. It's a cold water sport. And when we go back in time, like go back 20 years and you think about smallmouth, you had guys like Larry Dahlberg, um, Dave Whitlock, Harry Murray, 
these guys who are doing it at a different level. Um, but even back then, the fly patterns were so different. And in fact, everything was so trout centric that we took what we knew from trout fishing, like small woolly buggers. And like, we basically tried to put um, a round peg in a square hole and it worked well enough to give people enough success. And that went on for years and years and years until we can go into, you know, how like some of the bigger streamer patterns came to be and some of that stuff. But you fast forward now and you look at what has happened with like Blaine's game changer and the advent of the Dahlberg diver head and, um, you know, patterns specifically designed for smallmouth and, and targeting them. And it's been just mind blowing to see how quickly that has kind of come about. Um, a little earlier, you and I were kind of giggling a little bit about it, but years ago, there's a really good show in Michigan. Uh, I think it's the Warren, Michigan show. I was there. I'll tell you when it was, cause my daughter's going to be 17. She was in a baby carrier. So <laughs> she was two months old and we went to the Warren, Michigan show. This is when we were kind of only been in the shop for about four years. And we set up our booth for smallmouth bass, talking about guide trips for smallmouth. And um, I've mentioned this on a couple other podcasts, but I, I almost got laughed out of that show. Like smallmouth, like it was, it, it, and I just look back on that as such a poignant moment of like, oh my God. And then you look at what it is today. What, what is it today? It's a real deal. Yeah. Is it more people, are there more people now doing smallmouth than, than there are uh, trout? Um, I, I would say their sport nationally is still, you know, a trout sport. However, we have people traveling from all over the country to fish smallmouth that are just like our trout junkies that traveled everywhere for, um, you know, for, for, for trout, you know, they, they, they travel here for smallmouth and that has been really interesting and it's a big deal here. I mean, it's a really big, and it's not just a big deal in Wisconsin. Smallmouth has become a big deal all over. The Midwest is now the out west of what trout is. The Midwest is to the smallmouth bass fishery. Because I know, I know on the West Coast, um, I gave a talk there about something or another years ago. And in a lot of those areas, they're invasive. You know, if they've been they've been planted, and that's a that's a real uh, touchy spot. But but on our rivers, like you had mentioned just a little while ago, like that smallmouth bass is as native as our brook trout. Oh, yeah. And the millions of dollars, the millions and millions of dollars that like Trout Unlimited at a national level and at state levels have to do to create good spawning, gra- good spawning habitat, things like that. The amount of effort and work that it takes to create good trout water is a Herculean task where smallmouth they've held their own through deforestation. You know, I mean, it's, it's been crazy. The Algonquin name for smallmouth is Ash again, which is the one who struggles. And I think that's pretty badass. That is they're they're Yeah. They're definitely, I don't know how more, much more resilient, but they're definitely more resilient, right. Than Salmonids. That's, that's kind of the thing about them. So it's likely probably, yeah, with, with, uh, my guess with climate change or whatever goes on with all this stuff. And we're going to talk a little bit at the end about some of the conservation stuff you guys mm-hmm, have going mm-hmm. out there. But, but yeah, I mean, smallmouth bass will likely be the ones that, that potentially thrive during these situations. I mean, do you guys see that? Do you see the impacts from some of these conservation things impacting smallmouth at all? Deforestation and things is, is, is devastating. You know, like the Menominee River boundary water that we guide on a bunch was deforested entirely. It was actually called the cut cutover. And on both the Wisconsin and Michigan side for 114 miles of the Menominee and then another 126 miles of the Michigami was completely deforested of white pine. Like it was, it was stump, a stump field and the smallmouth still survived through all of that. Now mining and things like that, you know, poison, nothing can live in poison, but, um, they're, they're incredibly resilient. And there's some groups that are doing some great work. Um, Smallmouth Alliance doing great work, introducing smallmouth into some of these other streams that are too warm as cold water assets and, and, uh, and stuff like that. But a, a lot less goes into it. The only thing that goes into it that's really important is uh, fighting for uh, good regulations because they're an old fish. In our rivers, a 17 or 18 inch smallmouth could be upwards of 14 years old plus. Oh, so, amazing. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, that's crazy. Okay, well, let's just start this off. You know, from the 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 seasons. Well, you know, like right now we're we're kind of getting going into the, the winter time. What does smallmouth yep. look like throughout the year? When when is the best time, and how how long are you fishing this throughout the year? Well, our smallmouth season had traditionally opened the first Saturday in May, and that has changed now um, to I think it's catch and release. I think it's all season. I don't know. We catch and release anyway, but um, but it had always been that first Saturday in May. Now, that particular time of the year for us in a lot of places like out east, like they're catching smallmouth early, early because of their water temperatures are much warmer. But for us, we're, we're in the north woods. A lot of this water that's coming down from these reservoirs, even the first part of May might be, you know, off of a frozen reservoir. So it's, it's cold. But I would say our season starts out with that pre-spawn let's just say first part of may for us and and any of your listeners can figure out like okay it's probably april for us but or for them but um at that time of the year what we'll see is we will start to see what we call like it's the summer diffusion where some of those fish or the spring diffusion where some of those fish will start to drop out of those deeper waters and reservoirs and start looking for spawning areas not not ready to spawn but they're heavy and they're looking for for those spawning areas so it's a trickier time you have an opportunity at the biggest fish of the entire season because the females are loaded you know they're they're quite a bit heavier and um they'll start looking for those spots so at that time of the year it's primarily more of a dredging game a little deeper heavier stuff um to to, to get those fish to to bite but you're going to get your biggest your heaviest fish of the entire season then you then you start moving into it and then they start to spawn and what we have done as a shop is we've basically taken a two-week reprieve where the guides just stop guiding during that period of time the best that we can obviously um and let them do their their business because they are a hundred percent wild and native so after the spawn some of the females once we get into june some of the females will get a little bit haggard a little bit raggedy until they start putting some of their weight on but for us because of our river and the shallow nature of um, our particular body of water, it uh, it's it's suited really well for top water. So I would say during the guide season, eighty percent of our fishing is on the surface. If I were to collectively take that from the guide community, and we'll start getting smallmouth when water temperatures already hit like fifty degrees on poppers, fish slow. Um, but after the spawn. Um, into June and then the first part of July, we start rolling into really, really consistent top water action with migrations of dragonflies. First part of July, the damselflies start coming off and uh, we have an opportunity at, you know, fish that are in their happiest state of mind. You know, they're, they're, they're yeah. it's like their summertime. Oh, yeah. Yep. And then um, once we get into mid-September, Daylight hours start to change, get shorter, water temperatures start to drop. September and October can be exceptionally good smallmouth fishing. We just have to change tactics up a little bit and 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 go a little bit deeper for them before they start heading into those deeper reservoirs where it's it's more of a, um, a, a spinning game or a fly and float game, that kind of thing, which a lot of our customers aren't that fond of. Yeah, oh, I see. And, then, and so basically come November, December, I mean, things are pretty much shut down. Yeah, I mean, you you can still most certainly go get them, but um, it's a it's a different game. What I love about the smallmouth is like the nature of the fish, the aggressive, cool nature of the fish, and when you take that off of them, it, it's it's it it's not as much fun, you know. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, yeah. maybe that's just just me speaking broadly, but that's I I like to see the bite. I like to see a big streamer grab, you know. That stuff is awesome. Well, that's that's interesting. We had a um, a comment from uh, I think it was on the fly Kai on Instagram. He was asking about you know targeting big fish in cold mm -hmm. seasons, and I'm not sure mm -hmm. which species he was talking about. But if you put that to smallmouth bass, what would you tell him if you if he wanted to target big fish during the cold? And that I guess would be more, more of that early season or late later season. That I mean, yeah, that would be the earliest season, just because eggs are heavy yeah. <laughs> you know, as bad as that sounds like those those females are are are, are just giant you yeah. know ready to go in a couple of weeks um but in the fall we catch some goliath fish because they will even though they may be deeper they will put the feed bag on and start packing mm. on some winter weight so mm -hmm. those are both really good times to catch giant fish 
However, one of our guides, Nate Sippel, with a client caught a, it was a line class record, so it's on 10 pound tippet. His client caught the world record, which was a 24 and an eighth inch smallmouth, and that was on a top water fly in oh, wow. the first part of September. So, no kidding. What was the top water fly? Uh, I think it was a boogle bug, you know, just a popper, just a boogle bug popper. Yeah, wow. wow. And, then, and then you mentioned damsel, damsel flies and dragons. What, what other, I mean, what are all the fly? What could you be using, say, in September out there or just throughout the year for on the surface? Well, in September and October, if you have like nice warm falls like we have had, like the top water bite, like frog patterns, big diving frogs, like Whitlock's diving frogs, stuff like that are still super effective. And then you start looking at some of the streamer games and changing up line dynamics, like um, intermediate, full intermediates, sink, uh, intermediate, sink two, sink four, stuff like that. And then going with more of a, a larger intermediate bait fish pattern and patrolling with that stuff fished maybe not quite as fast but a, a, a strip and a pump strip and a stop that type of thing so that's that's kind of the patterns for those times of years so gotcha could you go out there in i mean so could, in november december you could still find fish you could still target mm -hmm. smallmouth yeah how would you do that if you were to say let's take us to mid-december and you want to just go try to chase some smallmouth how, how would you do that well, you've got you've got a couple different ways that you can do it. We have one way where we have a few of these warm water discharges that create a imitation um, like a tail warm water. water. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, a reverse tailwater, and um, we'll catch big smallmouth. You know, below some of those discharges. Uh, the other way is like float and fly techniques. A buddy of mine, Chuck Ragan, does a bunch of that stuff for more passive fish for stripers and some of that stuff too but it's basically an indicator with a small jig style streamer on it fish slow and bumped in some of the deeper holding water where those fish have migrated to so you the hard part is finding those migrating um sweet spots you know where these fish hang in those sweet spots and then you're if you find one you're going to find 20. no kidding so and these are yeah. in the actual in the river in the river yes sir yeah yep they spend the they spend the whole winter there they don't necessarily just go to the the lake part and hang out in 30 feet of water you know they'll suspend and they'll stay on the bottom but uh they'll be in slower moving deeper sections there you go so and that and and that would be the best way to do that would be floating and just kind of like indicator down as you're moving down that works that works the absolute best for me um is that float and fly technique during that particular time of the year but again you know, fishing dirty patterns, you know, big jig head stuff, you know, dredging stuff, clousery type of patterns are going to still get those fish. Yeah, no, it sounds like, uh, and out there and so that, yeah, I mean, obviously like you're saying, breaking the ice off your guys I and mean, you're, you're having to deal with <laughs> some of that, but what are the other challenges about fishing in, in the winter time for them? Uh, I mean, it's, it's basically just finding those pods of fish. I mean, that's that's a question we get all the time from people. Like, why do you why do you quit guiding in mid September? You know, because that's we we do, um, and it's it's just more repetitive fishing in deeper water with those style of techniques. So, I mean, that's that's just the challenge. When we look at the summer months and how dynamic um, the the bulk of the season is from the smallmouth angler, it's just so much fun to fish them in that fashion. You know, so it would be the equivalent of, you know, guys that are into swinging flies for steelhead and just looking for those couple of grabs or that guy rolling a bead under an indicator or spawn or something, you know, in deeper water. Um, just depends what 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 your poison is, I suppose. How, how would you find if you're going down? What, what, how would you find those fish? What would be the best, the easiest way? Because that is the biggest, always the biggest other than casting, reading the water, finding the fish is always the biggest struggle in in those winter months. Yeah. Uh, basically you find like where the reservoirs are, the, the, um, like we have a lot of dams on a lot of the rivers that we have. So a lot of those fish will push up to the base oh, right. of some of those dams or they'll fall way out and get to the very bottom end of it, almost where like the reservoir starts to open up where there's just a thin amount, like a fraction of current moving on it still. So there's that fine line between dead water and a little bit of current. You know, like, like they don't, they don't want to fight that current. They want to, you know, barely kick the tail. Yeah, that's right. So they can still get, and they're probably right in the feeding lane. So they're still ma mowing on stuff or they, whatever. They're, they they're just, yeah, like a minnow cruises by once every three days and they eat it. 
You know, they're, they're metabolic. The difference between a small mouth and a trout is this, like when water temperatures increase with the trout, like their metabolic rate and oxygen dissolves in the water, the, the trout like are in mortal danger. You know I mean? Like that when, when the water gets too warm and their metabolism really shuts down where a small mouth as the water temperature increases, it's the exact opposite. Same with carp, you know, they, they both switch gears and like the feed bags on. So even when it's 80, 90 degrees outside, our smallmouth fishing is epic. There you go. That's <laughs> well, let's go back. So we got the winter piece that you could, yeah. somebody could dig into, but if we're looking more, yep. you mentioned dragons and damsels. Talk about that a little bit. When's the peak time to be hitting that? And what, what's that like when you're fishing a damsel fly? That's a super cool question. And that's something that we, we'd written a smallmouth book a number of years ago. And it's one of the questions that I get at the shop all the time. And, um, we've, I don't want to say we've developed this cause this is not our development. We've just really kind of fine tuned it, but there's a chapter in there on what is a new classification that are just called wigglies. And it's been accepted kind of nationally as like a, a fly style, which is basically a bastardized Chernobyl ant, um, a, a, a bigger, a little bigger gaped hook, not big enough to gore the fish, but you know, a little wider gap hook to, to hold them other than just trout sized hooks. Um, but basically sponge foam bodies, um, wiggly legs, Charlie Pate, one of our guides in our store, our old store manager had developed a fly called the old Mr. Wiggly. And if, if we have time, I'll kind of tell the story of yeah, like how this, it. this all yeah. happened. Oh yeah. Years ago, uh, Dave Whitlock sent one of his buddies by the name of Jack Allen up here to fish with us. Uh, Jack Allen at that time was probably 75, 78 years old. And he booked us for like 10 days. And small mouth fishing for 10 days is a lot of effort because that's that's repetitive casting all day. And he had a he had a nerve disorder in his arm, but he he was a he's a very well known uh lar he was, he passed away now. He was a very well known largemouth bass guide in the Everglades. And everybody in our world that's like in the famous world of fly fishing, like 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 Lefty Cray, Dave Whitlock, Flip Pallet, they all know this guy. But he was like one of those like completely quiet down low. Nobody else knows this guy, right. but he's a like, ninja. Like the greatest, the greatest fisherman ever, but nobody knows. That's exactly what he is. That's exactly what it was. And, um, uh, since that time, I think, uh, Dave Whitlock sent me a, a postcard with, with Jack Allen and it, he, he had a quote on there called the King of pop, which was awesome. Cause he just fished top water stuff. But anyhow, he had this nerve disorder. So he would bring four weight fly rods at that time with like nine and 10 weight fly lines matched to them. And this was pre shooting heads, pre skagit, any, any of that kind of thing. And it was basically just so he could cast with that, that bad wing that he had. <clears throat> um, but he, he started to throw like, um, minnow patterns and regular hard head poppers that the guides had, um, you know, normally use on the river. And he's like, these are just, he'd say in his Southern drawl, Tim, do you have anything lighter? You know, he was just the, <laughs> yeah. the most laid back. He and his buddy would pass cigarettes back and forth through the boat. <laughs> it was like some of my best guide memories of all times. Um, but he opened his box and there's a picture of it in our book. And he called it the Nouveau Spider, which was basically a glorified sponge bluegill fly that was a little bit bigger and he had said in Henshaw's book of the black bass, it, there was a quote in there that said, don't forget the spiders. And he took that to heart. So he, he started to fish this little spider and it's windy. As and I'm like, this is going to be devastating. Like this is going to be really hard out here with this little spider. We're not going to catch anything. And we started fishing some of the calmer flats, some of the, the, the water that was like knee to thigh deep. And I watched a 17 inch smallmouth come up and sip the bug in. I was like, oh my God, thank God. You know, this is, you know, this is great. And we landed it. And fast forward a few days of this same scenario, we watched something happen with the smallmouth that our guides, even though we, we've done almost 10,000 guide trips down that river collectively through our, our course of our business. And I watched something. It was how the fish ate the bug. It wasn't a splashy explosion. It wasn't this crazy Pumper. bite. It, yeah. it, yep, yep. It, it was not what people would assimilate a bass bite would be. And in the book, we talk about like a couple different types, types of eats. And this particular eat we've classified as a confidence eat, which the fish is so certain that it's real 
that it has no reason to explode or anything. So they come up and they just eat it. Now, since that time, it has revolutionized our sight fishing, finesse, picky fish and how we fish them. And it has changed a lot of people's lives. It's not a cure-all. It's not something that you can just say, well, this is the bug. Yeah, the poppers still work awesome out there in certain situations. Right, but there's so many of your listeners that are smallmouth nuts that I'll guarantee a bunch of them can relate to this. They're fishing a popper and it just disappears. You know, there's no, there's, there's no explosion. There's nothing. Sometimes that happens. And it's because that was the confidence eat. It was at rest. You know, he thought it was a dragonfly or a damselfly and it came up and it sipped it. Um, so the, the question that we're confronted a, a lot, our whole staff is confronted on is like, what type of water are you fishing that? And, and we shot, um, uh, a meat eater show, a DOS boat episode with Joe Cermelli last summer and Joe was blown away and he was trying to describe it to some of his buddies. But the water type that I explained to him was most of it is it's got to be a feeding bottom, meaning it's got to be a mixture of all types of rock sizes, crayfish habitat, you know, like they have to be up there to be feeding. Um, so a lot of that water might only be knee to thigh deep with like in smooth, not fast, just kind of smooth flowing water. Now in that scenario, if the fish are in a really aggressive nature, anything will work. A popper will work. A game changer will work. A Murdoch minnow will work. Any of the big streamers will work. However, when the fish are in a passive feeding mode, and that's what we refer to like this passively feeding fish, meaning that I'm just going to maybe eat this. Oh, it's too good not to. They will deny poppers and they will deny big streamers in a lot of those scenarios, but they will come up and eat that wiggly. The wiggly. There you go. So it's more of a, yeah, I mean, you're getting in this situation where it does sound like, you know, the trout game where they got these finicky fish that sometimes you got to find. They're not always just hammering the the, the fly. I mean, th this is a, fin and, and these fly, is this wiggly? So it's imitating, uh, it could be a dragonfly, a damselfly. Is it imitating other surface bugs? This is the cool part of a smallmouth. Um, if you took a look at like, if you were fishing your favorite trout stream and you had an olive hatch that was coming off and there's olives all over the surface and there are fish that are rising nine times out of 10, unless it's a really tricky fish, you're going to fish a blue winged olive to them, right? I mean, that's what you would do. Smallmouth are not that discriminating. Um, they, it has to look, I think the best word I can use is foodie. Yeah, it was somewhat you know? <laughs> foodie, right, right. Uh, yeah, right. It looks foodie. So I think that the wiggly style of pattern could look like a dragonfly, a damselfly, a cicada, uh, you know, a, a host of stuff and um, non-fleeing stuff. Because we've all seen just dragonflies laying dead floating down the river or damselflies just dead floating down the river. And I think that that's all that they need. They want it to be, uh, so they don't need it to be moving a lot. No, no, they can be just kind of like slowly swimming because... Smallmouth don't hold in the same fashion most of the time as trout do behind a boulder or like th th they're not just waiting for food to come. Um, they're, they're, they're actively hunting, you know I mean? They're, they're, they're moving to fo food sources. So I think that that's the difference. However, like what that has happened for our staff and for our, more importantly, our clients that have fished with us, it is, has blown their minds because We've had opportunities in smallmouth, and when people think sight fishing for smallmouth, they think about fishing them on gravel or on their reds, and that's not what I'm talking about at all. This is standing on the rower seat of a drift boat and seeing three or four smallmouth just cruising in that water type and watching him come up Henry's Fork style and sip that right. bug in. So it, it it's incredible, Amazing. Dave. I, I mean, I, I do it every day of the week, and I have goosebumps talking about it to you right now. Yeah, yeah, that's that's awesome. Sight fishing for smallmouth. I mean, that's definitely the that uh, gets your uh, blood pumping. I mean, so when you're so when you're let's just take us to the river. So you're coming down, and are you guys doing this mostly out of boats? Yeah, yeah. You know, our our staff uses rafts, drift boats, jet boats. So it's it's most we we have an opportunity of covering seven or eight river miles in a day of slow water, um, of smallmouth water, and on foot, it's awesome and super effective, but not as effective. We can find all the players. 
how do you do that? So when you're going down the river, you're floating down. I mean, obviously your guides, you guys know where the fish mm-hmm. have been, but if, if it's like your first time down the season, you're trying to target sight fishing for smallmouth with these, say these damsels yeah. or, or this, uh, this wiggly, how are you, again, back to the thing, how are you finding the fish? How are you seeing the fish and, and getting, well, our water is really clear. It's tannin. So it, it's red, but it's red clear. Um, so the, a lot of the times our guides just kind of know where the fish are going to live in certain situations. It might be, swaying eelgrass weed lines with maybe a sand bottom, but there'll be fish in the pockets of those weed lines. Or like I had said, um, that, that, that shin deep cruising water. Mm. Yeah. Just find that water. Right. Yep. And, and the hardest part of, of, of doing that on foot is perspective wise, you know, you're, you're, you're down so much more and out of the boat, our guides stand on their seats an awful lot looking and that gives them a, a better perspective to do that. However, if you know the water types and understand what you're targeting and you understand the river bottom, that can the river bottom is just or even more important than what the river surface is in the smallmouth game um, because that's where the fish are. If you find pea gravel all over the place and it's all like dime nickel sized gravel everywhere, that typically is going to be sanctuaries for smaller fish. Um, the, the big fish, they're looking for crayfish, you know, they're, they're looking for that sort of thing. So we skip over a lot of that nursery water. So what is the substrate? What should the substrate for the prime time, the, the, the big fish? Everybody's rivers are different and ours are primarily rock. So like I, I would prefer rock over wood when it comes down to it. Um, however, like one of my really close friends, Kyle Zempel that owns Black Earth Angling Company guides on like the Wisconsin River, which is an incredibly dynamic river of sandbars, banks that changes by the day um, just because of the substrate, like you, you, you'd you said. Um, but so so each each watershed is different. But if you can find a combination of protection, food, uh, that, that's the stuff. And again, that rock, the types of rocks that you're looking for, you're looking for piles, you're, you're looking for, I'm not talking giant boulders. I'm talking, you know, like bowling ball size, you know, you know, stuff that a crayfish would hide under. That's the target. That's the target. So as you're going down, you're just looking for, and if you are thinking of the, the, the fish in this wiggly on the surface, are they actually looking for just fish or are they looking for rising fish? They're looking for fish specifically. And the smallmouth is really a, a weird creature. And this, this is kind of getting back to like the first parts of our talk, first parts of our statements about like what's happened, like the evolution of smallmouth fishing. Because years ago, you would go down the bank with a hair popper and just bang the banks as close as you could. And like, there it is. That's the magic of smallmouth fishing. Uh, Almost like large, just like large mouth. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's changed. It's changed so much uh, because of like some of these techniques, like the big streamer game, the articulated streamers, all of that has added to like uh, us being able to target these specifically as a creature, as its own specific fish. And, um, and that is, that is the fun part of it is learning those details and those details truly, truly have only started to arise in the last 10 or 12 years where it's been taken seriously by millions of anglers. Yeah. And probably the, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, obviously we're doing a podcast now, but just the access of information probably has helped get the word out and people have learned about the, and you mentioned, you mentioned the meat eater podcast. I'll put a link in the show notes to that. And we've had, um, we actually had, uh, Larry Dahlberg and, uh, and Dave Whitlock nice. on in past episodes. Nice. Yeah. I'll link, I'll link out to those. They were, we didn't talk to, but I mean, Dahlberg, obviously he dug it. His real point was, um, you know, he didn't make a distinction between any of the fishing. He was just like, it's all fishing. It doesn't matter if it's fly or gear right, or whatever. Right. Well, Larry is probably the most fishy human on the planet. He is. Yeah. Yeah. What, what is it? What makes him from, from your perspective, what makes Larry such a, such a powerhouse, such a unique uh, guy? You know, I, I don't, per, I, I, I've met Larry. I don't know Larry, but just from my, my perspective, you probably have friends like this, Dave, you have friends that are just fishy. I mean, like right. you've got good anglers and then you've got a couple buddies that are just inherently fishy dudes, Right. like he drips with fishy dude. And, um, Larry, the thing that I admire about his style is what, what he said. And I actually listened to that podcast that you guys did with Larry. Oh, nice. Um, his perspective is like, he'll float a sucker 
for muskies. He'll he'll fish a double cowgirl, you know, with musk, and he'll fish all of it super effectively because Larry wants to understand the fish at a different level, like on all levels. And then you can circle back with that knowledge to, I mean, we've been robbing, we've been robbing stuff from the gear world steady in, 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 in every facet of our sport. They got it. I mean, especially, well, I mean, all species, but yeah, I mean, bass, especially because you think of the bass circuit and how dialed in those guys are with whatever, I don't even know. Right. But oh. I mean, they can catch, they can catch fish like crazy. It's embarrassing. And, and, uh, I mean, like we try to emulate it, but like how, 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 however, like, on the flip side of that, like I, I live in smallmouth Mecca, like I have the Bay of Green Bay, like these guys have caught a couple of eight pound smallmouth in tournaments, which is like a freaking grouper. Mm. And I have watched something in the shop that's pretty interesting over the last 10 years, um, because we have a huge fly tying section in our store. These guys all come in and buy marabou and bucktail because they're tying jigs. But years ago, these guys were all winning these tournaments and getting all of these fish on, you know, big sluggos and big soft plastics. Oh, right. I have watched them now micro jigging for these giant fish. So oh, no it's kidding. really fun. Yeah. It's really fun to see them. They don't know what they're, what's happened, but they've essentially made a spinning fly. So why have they, why do you think they've evolved to that? I think some of it is the reason that we evolved to the wiggly in some cases, you know, maybe if, if it's not just educated fish, I don't know if it's the education of the fish and what they have learned, or if it's just the fact that we've dug deeper into that well of like, this is what can be done, you know, and like, this is working. Cause there was a, a couple of Canadian dudes that came down and just, it was like 10 years ago and I am not a tournament guy. It's not, it's not my, my, my jam. But I talk to these guys all the time and these guys swept that whole tournament and were like so secretive there. I'm like, can I help you with something? Like, no, they're tying a marabou jig, like micro jigs, but like they, they invented the wheel. There you go. Nice. Well, let's go back to the river. So we're, we're floating down the river and, uh, and if we talk, uh, you know, the wiggly and this is kind of a, what, J July through September where you could fish the. It's really a June because we'll, we'll start to see. To, to back the train up a little bit, first part of June for us, end of May, first part of June, after the fish get off of the spawn, in a lot of watersheds that people don't really even identify is we'll start to see a really big dragonfly migration. And we have, I, I don't know what species it is, but they're massive. It's a flying helicopter. Um, but they will start to migrate to the shorelines and we'll start to see shucks all over the place. Now, do the smallmouth necessarily key in on just those? The answer is definitive no, but they're very aware. And um, that is the first inkling of us like like getting wiggly fish um, because they're, they're, they're still damp. You know, they, 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 they make mistakes, they fall in, that type of thing. However, a really cool tactic that we use that's obviously used in the trout world all the time, but not so much in the smallmouth world is we'll do a popper and a dropper. So Charlie has got a couple of flies through um, Montana Fly Company. He's got Pate's uh, dropper dragon, uh, his old Mr. Wiggly and stuff. But a lot of times I'll just fish a popper and drop a piece of mono off of that, maybe 14 inches, and then put this dragonfly nymph as a tandem on it. The popper becomes your indicator or your topwater bug, and the dropper... Um, as you're bumping that fly, you're adding a little bit of motion to that. And sometimes it'll be 80, 20 that they'll eat that dragon during that period of time. And that's a dragon that's not on the surface. That's just down. Right. It's the, it's the nymphal form. Yeah. And, and, and if, if, if any of your listeners look at, I think it's called Pate's, um, dragon dropper. Uh, I know we have it on our website, but it, it, it's, it's not super heavily weighted. So it's not hard to cast in tandem with a popper with like a seven or an eight weight. So it's, it's a really effective way to do it. So, so, so those dragons will be around, but the big migration happens first part of June. And then that will kind of peter out. And then we see a couple of unique scenarios on our watershed. We'll start to see, it's kind of like a little spruce moth that flips around on the surface, much bigger than a caddis. But even though they don't key on them, I think just the surface activity brings their heads to the surface, you know, like, hey, there's something up here, too. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that um, a lot of your avid smallmouth anglers might think that this is crazy, but this is this is a fact and a phenomena that we see. 
uh, on a lot of our basswood trees that hang over the river, we'll see these small inchworms that are, you know, maybe, I don't know, they're not an inch, they're maybe a, they, they, maybe an inch, maybe, maybe in, half an inch, they're tiny. Um, but if you have a calm day, they go down that thread and you'll see them dipping into the water once in a while. And almost always you'll see two or three smallmouth below those and they'll still eat a popper. They'll probably still eat a stream or two. However, those are some of those little tiny nuances that, you know, the more you do this, the more you start to see and piece together that puzzle that we talked about. There you go. Okay. And, and I, you know, just thinking again on the river, I love the popper dropper. That That's an awesome, you know, it seems like whenever you add dropper to anything, it always sounds like a cool combination, you know, the popper, <laughs> the, the popper dropper, the, uh, uh, I had Hank, I had that's Hank, it, Pat, hopper I had, dropper, exactly, hopper I had uh, Hank Patterson on a while and he has that skit oh where he has God. like the hopper, the hopper dropper and a dropper hopper and a hopper <laughs> dropper hopper, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's cool the way this is, I'll um, that episode out. yeah, yeah, ch- check that one out. It's definitely good. I will, good. Well, certainly will. <laughs> Um, in fact, in that one, usually on these episodes, I don't cut in and edit a, a much, you know, but on that one, I edit in like a few spots where it was clips from his YouTube channel. Oh God, it's hilarious. Yeah, so it's pretty funny, but, um, <laughs> okay. Well, I'm circling around. I mean, obviously we're going to run out of time here, you know, doing this episode, but, um, but tell me so far, we've talked about a lot of stuff. Let's just yeah. take us to that June through say September, the prime time. What else are we missing here? What, what else would you tell somebody if they were going to be planning a trip uh, and heading out there? Anything else they need to know? I mean, yeah. it sounds like a popper, dropper, having – what, what about any, like, lines? Is that stuff critical or what, what do we got that going? That stuff is critical, but most of the time, you know, it's 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 a floating line that casts well on your rod is what we – end. you know, I mean, so – but one thing that I, I will say to your listeners, especially those that are getting into the, the game, is um, this is a really important part – and this is a big segment in our book. And we talk about how we talked about earlier, how banging the banks. Well, once we get into July and August, you start getting into much lower water in most cases. So the water drops out. However, the, the main river channel always still exists in the river. So we, we talk about the first drop or the second drop. The Right next to the bank, there might only be four or five inches of water or two inches of water well a giant smallmouth can't survive you'd see his back out of that water unless they're super hot and super aggressive which we do see but my advice to your listeners is back way off and fish that next drop off like that next shelf of the main river channel in a great way of doing that and executing especially if you, you don't know all of these nuances or you're just getting into it if you fish like a bigger streamer like like Charlie's Evil Snowflake or Navi's Minnow or or uh, Murdich Minnows, Game Changers, off of those ledges, cast on the shallow side of the ledges and bring them off of those ledges, those fish will be on those ledges transitioning into a little shallower water, but they'll hunt there. So all summer long, you can play that game. All summer, seven days a week. Um, but, uh, you know, you can fish topwater, popping bugs over that, something maybe... Um, a normal size so that they can see it because you're in a little deeper water, maybe with a better acoustic pro- profile, that type of thing. Okay. Okay. And what's the bumping? You mentioned the bumping. What, what does that look like? What, what is that exactly? Well, there's, there's two different things that you can do to a fly. And I have found, and all of our guides have found, you can convince a lot of those passive feeding fish into biting by marionetting the fly, like actually controlling and dictating what the fly does in the water with top water. Describe that. So is this while it's uh, swinging down or across or, yeah, how are you doing that? You would be going, you'd be moving with your fly dead drift down the river and trying to keep it 45 degrees in front of the boat. Show the fly to the fish before the boat. And a pop is obvious. Take your slack out, make a a pop, you know, make make the fly, make an audible bloop out of that. And then let it roll. You know, don't keep popping it in most cases. Pop it once, let it roll, give them time. Sometimes you pop it again on their head and they don't eat it. So let it roll, let it marinate. When we talk about bumping it, we're basically talking about bending its legs, like no pop, no nothing, just move it. So sometimes we'll see a big smallmouth come up on our bug. And if I pop it, he'll sink. If I just bend its legs, wiggle it a little bit, let him come back up to it, let it float. And if he doesn't eat it, then bump it again. You know, I mean, like you, you, you manipulate that fly to what, the, the, the fish is telling you, 
Wow. So while you're doing this, say you're on a guide tripper with one of your guys, you're going down and you're, you're the client in the front of the boat. Is this like a, uh, is this like the guys up on his chair guiding the whole thing? Or is it kind of up to the guy in the front? I mean, is he, is he actually off. say, is yeah, as he say like, there's the fish, do bump this, it, do this. Bump it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The guides are very, very specific. I've got probably, I've worked with a lot of guides in my life. I've got probably one of the best guide groups I've ever been around and every one of them is a teacher i mean like they, this is what they they teach they teach people patiently and calmly and will help people with like, like bump it let it roll let it roll bump it again hit them you know like yeah we we work as a team client guide there you go that's this is uh yeah the more you get into this the more you realize this sounds like a just um i mean an amazing uh, destination and and it sounds like it's as good as any crazy fishing experience that you could think of. I mean, is that kind of what it feels like to you? It is, but we've screamed really quietly about yeah, it. Yeah, nobody knows. So. <laughs> That's right. You're trying to, so the problem, the fact that this is going to go out to a lot of people, this is, uh, this is, well, and you've already been in the meat eater. So people are realizing, learning yeah, about it. Yeah, are you seeing yeah, the and, effects and, of that? We, we, we have seen, we have seen some, some, some more people come up to the river and fish. And, and it is one of those things like people can come up with mixed results on their own even good smallmouth fishing fishermen, um, the, the river has details, a lot of details. And, um, some of them do really well. And we've had guys come up and like, we fished for three days and we caught two. Um, but, um, we have, we have seen a little bit of a bump, but we had to do it to help protect the river as best that we could, you know, and, and, uh, keep the fishery that we have. So yeah, it's important. Perfect. perfect. One story you mentioned here we, I wanted to dig into is Lefty Cray. We had an episode on Lefty <laughs> Cray. I'll put a link to that one. And I always, during that series, I was asking people, you know, okay, what, what is your Lefty Cray story? And I was getting some good ones and then some were kind of like, you know, maybe didn't know him as well. It sounds like you have a good Lefty story. I do. Lefty, I, I, I've, I've been lucky enough to get to fish with a, a number of these, these legends of our sport, you know, and me being a nobody, but these guys are like, it's jaw dropping to get to fish with these guys and hear stories. Uh, Lefty fished with us for a, a lot of years. Uh, came up to fish smallmouth. It's still his favorite. Was still his favorite fish. And um, he and his. It's it, one of his physicians. He's a great guy. I think his name is Mark. It's his one of his best friends was with him. So he was with his physician. And Lefty was ninety two at that point. Maybe oh, he was wow. ninety one. Yep. Still, still giving her. And they had just changed his medications because he had some heart some heart issues. That was no secret among anybody. Mm. And he changed his medications. And I was on a two boat trip. It was Nate in another boat with two of Lefty and Mark's friends. And then it was Lefty and his physician. And Lefty at lunch, we were only halfway, not even a third of the way down the river. And Lefty at lunch is like, I'm, I'm Tim, I'm feeling a little bit dizzy. Mm. And his physician, Mark came over and he said, Lefty, you're having a heart arrhythmia right now. Oh, wow. And there is nothing worse as a guide for anybody to Jeez. have that situation. But at that point, I had no motor on my boat, my drift boat. It's just a big push out. And I talked to Mark. We were not terribly far from, we were actually maybe only 20 minutes from a hospital, like if we needed to to get to that point. And Mark's like, well, we have to get, we've got to get his medication back on. So I took my cooler out of the front of my boat and I put down all of my life jackets so he could lay down so he could elevate his feet. And Mark is, he's his doctor. So he's kind of directing me and lefty is fading in and out of like sleep or consciousness. I don't know, but I can tell you there is nothing more stirring than looking in the front of your boat and thinking like, I'm going to kill the babe Ruth no of kidding. fly fishing today. <laughs> so I rode us out and lefty would keep saying, Timmy, how much more? Oh, oh wow. like lefty about 10, 10 more months. God damn it. You said 10 minutes an hour ago. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> but so, so long story short, we got him down. Uh, his doctor got his medication back on track for him. And like, but I remember lifting lefty out of my boat, laying him in the back of the, you know, the, the, the back seat of my, my pickup. And, uh, it was the most horrifying day of my entire life. And he, I mean, the next day of, obviously he didn't fish the next day, but, um, that's that's my lefty story. Wow, that's yeah. And lefty is uh, so. Did be before this? Did you uh, did you know him a little bit? Did you fish for, uh, with him before? Did you? Um, yeah. Yep, I'd I'd fished with lefty for a number of seasons. He would come up um, each season and fish with us for three or four days with a couple of his buddies for smallmouth. So 
what was um you know we talked about this a little bit on the past but lefty was such that he was a bigger in life guy and he seemed like he was everybody's mentor what what, to you what, what do you remember about him what was unique about lefty well, you know, everybody who's met Lefty knows his stories and like, they're just unbelievable, but they're real. Like I remember him telling stories about, yeah, I was in Cuba and we were, I was with Hemingway and we were going to have <laughs> dinner with Castro. I'm like, Jeez. are you sh-? it, it's stuff like that, you know, like just mind benders, just yeah. mind benders. Um, but you know, you look at, this is a whole different podcast day, but you look at like the heroes of our sport, the guys that we've looked up at like, sadly, you know, uh, Whitlock's birthday was just, just the other day. And like, he's starting to get older and he's, you know, and like the, the people who are true heroes in our sport, we're, we're losing all of them. And the history needs to be retained of this because we're in a, we're in a different era right now of social media and people, you know, being able to, you know, become their own type of famous, but nobody will be that famous to me, those guys. No. No, I know. Yeah, it's, it seems like a different. I mean, it is. It's kind of a different era. You have the lefties, and I mean, and there are people that are just killing it and doing great things. But um, yeah, you wonder about that. Who's going to fill the shoes? Uh, I think the answer is nobody. Yeah, unfortunately. So nobody. How do we? How do we document? You know, like the history piece. How does that? Because I'm trying to do a little bit of it here, doing these conversations. But yeah. Well, I think I think I think what you're doing is awesome, Dave, because I think that that has to be spotlighted to people who are new into our sport to understand the magnitude of what some of these individuals truly did for our sport. And it's it's just keeping that awareness um, alive and in, in letting these people understand because they no longer have that voice of a social media platform or something like that. Or did they ever care to because they 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 got their their fame and notoriety the hard way. They developed something really incredible. They became the casting guru of the world and changed dynamics of casting or they hit the road and did all the show circuits and they, you know, they, they made it or they're an artist like Dave or, you know, and, and, and now it's, it's, it's a little different. It's who, who posts better or who does this. And it's, it's a different, it's a different one. Good, bad or indifferent. It's a different thing. Yeah. It's a different thing. You're right. Yeah. I think there are some people that are, yeah, doing great. I mean, that's the thing is that, that social media and all that stuff is is easy to do poorly, you know. And and uh, yeah, but, but you know, if you yep. can do it really good and you're transparent and stuff like that, then it, it can work out. And and really, for it's sure. more about it for me. I mean, we've gone through COVID now, but for me, it's more like it seems like okay, that's a way to connect to people, which is amazing. But I love. I mean, really, I love you, that part. Yeah, right. Yep. I mean, being able to connect with all these people love around it. the world, but, but but really, you still need to get in person and connect, right? You need to go and visit yes. people and have a like yep. for you. You know, we haven't ever met in person, but I mean, I yeah. can tell you, I would love to come up there and do a trip, and you know, that yeah, be sit down, have cool. a beer. You're like a buddy already. Exactly this is how this works. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, here, here's a good one. This is I want to paint the picture for people listening because this is audio, but um, we had a good question from another listener who said. Um, uh, some tips for like short person tips. And this is kind of a funny question, right? Because you got short. I, I'm yeah. about, I'm about six foot tall and stuff like that, which is sure. I'm pretty. Yeah. But I know you, this is the funny thing about you is that I want to paint the picture for what you look like, because some people say, do you look like Joe exotic at all? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I guess the answer is yes. Yeah, yes. I, I do I, look I, just like Joe. I have the same mustache. It's, it's terrible. It's yeah. just terrible. So you have yeah. you had this. So, so if, but people maybe don't know Joe Exotic, but he was this crazy guy. I watched some of those shows where he <laughs> he was this. Uh, I think he went to prison for some stuff. Like he tried to like attempted murder, I think attempted or something. murder or something. <laughs> something kind of big. But, but he had this show which was crazy about these wildlife, and he had this really engagement to lions and tigers and stuff. Anyways, there's oh, yeah. a whole Joe Exotic. I'll put a link to. The, I'll put a video <laughs> of the show notes to that. But for you, I, I say that because it's kind of funny, and you have a nice uh, the goatee. But you're kind of uh, like, uh, would you say you're tall? And, and and kind of uh, you know normal skinny build. Uh, that's it. I'm 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 five ten. Yeah. You know, 160 pounds. Just there you go. Like, yeah. I'm just, yeah. You're the yeah. average. You're an average. I'm like, regular good. dude. I feel like we we have a pretty good uh, flavor for you know this. I mean, really smallmouth bass, and we haven't even dug into some of the other species like we said at the start. But yeah. Yeah. Um, as, as I guess if people want to dig in deeper to this, is there you get you have a book? What's the name of the year? What's the title of that book? The the book is called Smallmouth Modern Fly Fishing Methods, Tactics, and Techniques, and it's Dave Karzinski and Tim Landwer, and then the other authors are Charlie Pate, Nate Sipple, and Bart Landwer, who are also guides to the shop. But it's basically 
it's in its third printing and it's basically um, start to finish a lot of the stuff that we talked about and we covered here, everything from the wiggly bite to identifying water to tackle. But I'm proud of it because I, I, I don't want to boast, but it is more next level um, beyond kind of what the norm has been mm. by, by large margins. And it's done very yeah. well. And what about another resource? I always like to ask this just to, you know, because you mentioned a few people there, but is there another great resource somebody could dig in, books, magazines, videos, anything out there? Oh, boy. I mean, the, the thing is, is right now there's just so much stuff, you know, YouTube, any fly you want to tie. You look at like like Blaine Chocolate's videos on Game Changers, um, you know, Gunner Bram, some of the younger guys that are up and comers that are really building incredible streamers and stuff like that. Like a lot of these guys have done a really good job, not only on social media, but on, um, the how to's and, you know, how to, how to tie them. There's also good Facebook groups like Bass on the Fly is a good Facebook group that, you know, has thousands and thousands of members that are all smallmouth junkies. I think it's smallmouth on the fly or smallmouth junkies. So there's a lot of resource. You can check out our social media at Tightlines Fly Fishing Co. WI or find Tightlines Fly Fishing Company on Facebook. And we post fairly regularly and not just smallmouth stuff, but the goings on of Midwest angling. Perfect. So, so Facebook is a good place to connect. Uh, yep. uh, Fa yeah. Facebook and Instagram. Yep. yep. Okay. Perfect. Well, let's take it out here. We have a segment, the 222 top uh, flies, tips and resources. And we're, we've already talked about a lot of this, but I just want to yeah. highlight this again. So fly wise, we, we mentioned the wiggly. Would you toss, uh, what else would you put in there with, if you had a couple of flies you were going to take? Okay. Here, here's, here's, here's going to be kind of my, 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 my top five or six here. Yeah, let's do it. We're going to talk about like the wigglies in, a number of colors they, they do them in four colors so like i won't go that deep but like wiggly style patterns boogle bug poppers montana fly poppers the murdich minnow the game changer charlie's evil snowflake and brownie they make them in two colors and nabby's minnow that's seven seven but i years. i think that i think somebody could go to most any of our resources with those types of flies and have good luck that discludes like dredging patterns like clousers and stuff. But during the prime months, like that's gonna, that's gonna do, um, the majority of what a guy is going to need to do to be effective. There you go. Okay. And, and as we're back on the river, we're, we're in floating down and we're trying to target some of those fish. Uh, uh, you know, we've talked about a few tips. Give us a couple more tips as somebody that maybe they're, they're having a hard time, you know, getting some action here. What would you tell yep. them? Yep. Um, you know, just, just be really aware of what's going on. Watch that fly. Don't look at the fly. Look at the, look at the water as a hula hoop, not at just the fly. So you can see incoming fish, things like that. People are amazed all the time. And our guide's like, how did you see that? We're looking at through it at a little different lens. Um, we're looking for what's coming and, and not just what's on it. The other thing that's really important with smallmouth that most people like the, the best tip that I can give them is we're fishing with almost like 10 or even up to eight to 12 pound tippet. When you hook a smallmouth, they are street fighters. They're not a runner like a trout. You don't put them on the reel. There's no necessity to put them on the reel. They're going to fight a lot harder than a trout, but they're going to fight close and really hard. So when you hit that fish, when you strike the, that fish listeners, long belt length strips, as long of strips as you can until you have that fish pinned so hard because we lose 90% of our fish in the first five seconds. They set the hook and then they don't do anything and they don't get that hook buried in it. So long strips almost feel like you're going to break them off. The fish will dictate at that point, like, okay, now you can ease up. Perfect. Perfect. And are you, st and you're still setting the hook actually with your rod yep. pretty good? Yep. Yep. Same type of thing, but you just want to get that slack up. Don't wait for the fish to do something. Get that slack out of there and get that hook in that fish's mouth. Perfect. And we, um, you mentioned uh, lenses. We recently did an episode with uh, Costa and we talked about kind of glasses and selecting glasses. Is that something that's a requirement, having good polarized glasses out there? It's, it's uh, other than your rod and reel, it's like the most important thing. Like I, I couldn't do my job without, without yeah. good, good well, glass. What do you go with? What, tell, tell me about, I mean, I know there's a bunch of different brands, but like, what do you use and what are your like lenses, the color and stuff like that? I am a two lens guy. I, I, I'm not a gray lens guy ever. I'm always like the copper or the, the amber color and I'm a Costa guy. Um, but, um, copper or amber, I like the glass lens cause they don't scratch. Uh, they do break, but they don't scratch at least. 
And I also carry a pair of like the, I think the color is amber. It's, it's like almost yellow low light situation stuff is, is, is pretty key. Cause those early mornings, those, those nasty days, um, it's not as good looking through tinted windows no, during that time. No, that, that's something I've always had. I've always been the two lens and I've had, um, you know, even before I had these coasts, which are pretty cool. Um, yeah. You know, I always had a, a yellow lens because, yeah, when you're out there and it's almost dark, those yellow lenses are the only thing that really is going to let the light in. That's right? it. And you have those days where it's just like a crappy yeah, overcast day yeah. all day raining on you and they're just happier lenses. So so we'll skip uh, the resources we talked about, probably your book and, um, yep. and Blaine and some of the videos. Those are some good ones. Yep. Um, yep. Let's just talk as we take it out of here. Um, just on the conservation piece, the Smallmouth Alliance. And, uh, yeah. and you also mentioned Sawyer because they were a sponsor uh, this last year. To talk yeah. about their aura and that alliance, just, just a little bit. Give us a heads Absolutely. up. Absolutely. Well, we, I had an opportunity along with uh, Matt Stockton, who's a really incredible artist. You should get him on the podcast. Incredible artist of, of, of great nature from Michigan. But uh, I was talking to Derek, and I know that you had Derek on the show a while ago. Derek's a buddy of mine, but I am their oh, cool. Sawyer ambassador for the Midwest with their oars. And because they are a very conservation oriented company, it was really a cool opportunity that Derek and I had talked, like, let's do one of your artisan oars. They've done steelhead, you know, Pacific Northwest stuff to help raise money. So we teamed up. I talked to uh, Stockton about some art and he got it to Sawyer and they Sawyer now produces a, uh, a square top artisan. And I think, uh, I, I think a couple different oars with that smallmouth graphic on it and a portion of those proceeds go to the smallmouth alliance which is you know basically a, a small organization right now but doing what needs to be done for conservation and regulations etc so really a cool partnership and the finest ores I mean, yeah. I'm not oh, saying yeah. that because I'm their ambassador. I I pick those oars. I could tell you, I uh, I've been I've used all sorts of oars in this last Ugh. year. I I picked up those uh, square tops, um, and uh, part of the reason I got them because I knew my kids they struggle with my own oars on the drift boat rowing. They're yep. they're like nine and seven because they're so yeah. heavy. But these square tops, man, I mean, they could actually row because they're kind of counterbalanced. Super super light, and I've got a couple of my buddies that are running the uh, the Sawyer Bandits, which are. I, I think they're like a pound and a half a piece. They're, oh, they're the ridiculous. Old These are, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but the square tops, that, that's a question that we get like, do you like the square tops versus just their, their, their round shaft? And I like the square top because a lot of times when I row, if I'm standing, I put the oar behind my leg to kind of like maneuver or, or row. And it's just, it's a good spot behind my knee or just pushing with the palm of my hand. I like the feel of that flat piece on there. It's just, that, no, that's a great point. I, I'm I'm curious on your boat. So, are you guys working? Um, are you doing drift boats there? Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, we do drift boats, rafts, and jet boats. But like, I would say the primary uh, workload is done in a hard boat. Yeah. What's the? Um, and in fact, I'll put a link to it. We had a whole. I did a little mini se podcast series on uh, the history, like drift boats and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. But cool. Uh, that was part of the reason when I connected with uh, with Sawyer and and uh, but. Yeah. You know, part of that was it's really interesting history, obviously. But what, what do you go? What are your boats? You guys have a mix of different brands. We have a mix of different brands. I have been for the last 22 years, uh, like a diehard Hyde guy still. And I, I really like the Hyde Low Pro XL for my needs because it's a bigger boat than some of the skiff stuff. But the bigger the bigger boat, we have some significant whitewater on a couple of our pieces of, of river that can be a class three or almost dipping into a four with a huge wave train in it. And even with that low pro, like I can, I can roll that in extremely big water and my customers, cause I've been doing it so long. My customers are getting older and I like the ability to have a bigger footprint inside, you know, for, for, for customers and stuff. Um, but, but we've, we've got everything from, you know, our guides are all over the map. A couple of our guides are adipose guys and clack guys and, you know, we're we're all over so and i saw you did that tornado you, you did one with the the guys from tornado yep. that is a really cool anchor system and those guys are awesome they've got something right there that's a cool anchor i know I, i've been uh whenever i can i've been using it and it's uh, there is no question that anchor stops better than the old pyramid style anchor. for certain like yeah. not even not even not even a question of it no no it's good so, and, uh, yeah there's so one think, trick there's, there's yeah, one trick with the anchor though at the end of the day 
before you take it off of your um, your beaner, yeah. you have to tilt it because it does hold enough water that like it'll look like you pissed your pants. Like oh, you'll, really? you'll, 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 dump, you'll dump a quart of water on you. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize that. So it holds water. Where, now, how does it hold water? Where does it hold it's it? It's just between the pans. Like, you oh, know, wow. how, how it's got the segments in the pan. So I just, I, I've just, just know like part of my breakdown routine at the end of the night after a guide trip is just kind of giving it a little kick and you'll, you'll lose a couple cups of water out of it. I never, yeah, I never realized that. And, uh, well, get the, you know, uh, Tim, this is getting to that you know, point. It's like these are these are always tough with guests like yourself because we got so many topics we could dig oh, into. Oh, I get uh, it. I get I wanna, it. This has been I want to definitely respect your time here. But give us one last one here, um, just quickly at the Smallmouth Alliance. Where could people dig into that if they want to learn about what they have going? Well, I, I think they can find them on social media as well. Um, but the Smallmouth Alliance, uh, I, I, I'm not sure what their website name yeah, is. Which I, I is can put a link. Terrible, I'll put a link yeah, to that. But, but they, they yeah. have a great um, uh, a, a great website and people can be aware and help support um, a very worthwhile cause, especially, you know, moving forward. And and and, and they need conservation, obviously, in, in good water. But a lot of the push can be on uh, helping with regulations and getting some of the regulations because our, our smallmouth regulations here are five fish, 14 inches, which is ridiculous. Um, there should you be a slot limiter. It, well, I think that it, on a normal day, we could go out and catch 15 fish because you could keep the captain's catch too. And uh, I'll tell you what, if our guides were out there, if seven guides are out there seven days a week at 15 smallmouth of 14 inches, like I would ruin that river. Like it's, that's an unsustained, like it is legit. Now we're all catch and release no matter what, even that world record, but that's an unsustainable number for avid, avid anglers. So, um, just to push for some of that kind of stuff, just uh, reasonable, reasonable, tolerable levels. No, it's good. I think that there, you got to have, uh, you know, you got to have people speaking for you, you know, for the cause. And that's the fact that you have the small mouth Alliance says a lot about your area. You know, I don't, I'm sure yep. They're they're probably my my guess is they're kind of national, but they're focused in certain regions. I think it started. Uh, Tim Holschlag had started it in Minnesota, and there's there's just a handful of the chapters, but they're they're very active. And I know the uh, Illinois Smallmouth Alliance is crazy active. They do an incredible job. So, yeah, yeah. There you go. No, this is perfect. Well, I feel like, um, you know, and, and I'm obviously I'm out on the West Coast, but uh, whenever I do these shows, I mean, I, we have so many listeners in the Midwest and we see it just from talking to people and stuff. I always feel like it's almost my it's like my hometown. You know what I mean? You know, <laughs> it's kind of like well, that you place. got a place to stay anytime, Dave. You come there you on go. In. There you go. All right. Midwest wanna, nice. Yeah, yeah, nice, nice. Uh, so, yeah, no, this is this has been awesome, Tim. So, um, just uh, here's my random one. I always love to if I get a chance. Are you more uh, kind of like podcast, or do you listen to more music or podcast during the day, or if you did listen to one or the other? I listen to I, I listen to music during the day, but I do a lot of driving between doing talks, seminars, and fishing and guide trips, and I'm, I am a, a podcast drive guy. Oh, good. All the time. Good, good. Well, give me your, so I want to get, I've been doing this little five uh, and I don't know if you can get five, but what are the five, you can remember the the last five, not your favorite five, but the last five podcasts you listened to? Um, Tom Rosenbauer, the Orvis podcast. Love that. Uh, Joe Cermelli and the Bent podcast. Oh, the Bent. Yep. 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 I got to co-host that with him a couple weeks ago. That was super cool. Um, let me think, uh, I'm an avid archer. I'm an avid bow hunter. I listen to the, the meat eater podcast and Cal's week in review. Um, but, uh, I think those are probably the last four or five that I've listened to. Yeah. Yeah. I'll put, I'll put some links in the show notes to those as well. I think, um, awesome. yeah, the bet, the bent is good. I wasn't, didn't even, this shows you how, how amazing, uh, podcasting and how the growth is kind of unlimited because there's so many times you hear from people that I didn't even know there was a bent podcast. You know what I mean? It right, shows you how, right. how loop I was. And I mean, I know yeah. I'm sure since it's meat eater, they probably have all sorts of great information there. Well, call up Joe, get on, you should, you should get on, get, get on the bent podcast with That's Joe. That's right. Yeah. I'll, I'll give, I'll give <laughs> or, a, or, 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 or get or, them either way, have, get them on. Have, 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 have Joe come on. Tell him, tell him Tim sent you. Yeah, that well, might not be good. Don't do that. Maybe all right, don't, don't do, do that. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'll, I'll follow up with you. All right, Tim. Uh, so, yeah, we got tightlinesflyshop.com if people want to connect with you. Yes, sir. That'd be perfect. All right, man. Well, I will definitely keep in touch with you. And uh, maybe if we could put something together, uh, you know, or at least at nothing else, promote what you have going and get the word out and get a few more folks up your way. But, uh, yeah, I want to thank you for all the, the time today and everything you've done in the last 20 years, uh, you know, kind of well, doing good you, stuff brother. in smallmouth. Yeah, it's been good to talk I to you. 
I appreciate it, man. It's been a it's been a pleasure talking to you. It's like talking to an old friend. So this has been a lot of fun. Awesome. All right, Tim. We'll talk to you uh, soon. All right, Dave. Take care, buddy. Bye bye. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all the links, and everything else we covered today, head over to wetflyswing.com slash 273-273. Click that subscribe button if you haven't already. If you're new to the show, you want to hear the whole back catalog, get new episodes, just click subscribe, and you'll get updated when that next episode drops. And right now, we've got another Fly Shop Friday episode coming at you. Coming at you strong uh, in two days on Thursday. Fly Shop Friday on Thursday. Uh, Brian Fisher from Sonora Fly Co. is here. He's going to walk us through the seasons in the Sierra Nevadas and um, and a little bit on Yosemite. Uh, some good California stuff. Back to California tomorrow. Click that uh, plus symbol if you're in Apple Podcast and, uh, and I guess uh, not subscribe. Follow the show. Follow the show on Apple Podcast. That is it. That's a wrap. That's all I have for you today. I uh, appreciate you for stopping by and uh, checking out the whole show. Looking forward to catching up the next episode and seeing you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. 